but tonight we continue in our Embracing the Questions worship series. And tonight we're going to look at the question, why do good things happen to bad people? And then we're going to look at why do bad things happen to good people? Last week, I invited one of my friends from undergrad, and she brought her choir to sing. We've got another special guest today. Um, where is Charles at? There he is. So Charles was a viola extraordinaire back in the day, and he's still, he's still doing amazing things. <laughs> at High Point Central, he's the orchestra and choir director. So we're going to hear a piece tonight um, from a part of their orchestra and a small part of their choir tonight. So can you give them a round of applause for this special <laughs> um, Right now, I want to introduce um, Sarah. She's got a special announcement for you guys from ADT. Let's welcome her. Hi, uh, I'm Sarah Siebert. I'm the chaplain for Alpha Delta Theta. It's a Christian service sorority on campus. Um, and tonight we're having a fundraiser at fries, all that good stuff. Um, so I'm here to invite all of you to please come after chapel. Um, it's going to be until 9 o'clock. And come meet our girls, come fellowship with us, and just make sure you say you're there for ADT, please. Thank you, guys. And now I want to invite Lauren up to say a special word about Tri Sigma. Where are the Tri Sigmas in the house? Thank you guys for being here. Hi, okay, I'm Lauren and I'm a sophomore in Tri Sigma and I'm just here to talk about our philanthropy a little bit and our sorority. So our philanthropy like focuses on three things, it focuses on scholarship, leadership, and play therapy in hospitals. And a few weeks ago we actually raised over $1,500, um, which is being given to like all the kids and all like the hospitals with all the play therapy we do. And we also work with March of Dimes, which is another part of our philanthropy. Um, and then also I really wanted to thank like the whole chapel community, the board of stewards, um, both reverends obviously, um, yeah. also the Sigmas back there, I see you guys, and student employees, um, <laughs> just everybody overall, and like thank you guys so much for letting us host. All right, are you guys ready to continue in worship? settle ourselves in our seats and get ready for prayer. So once you find yourself at a resting, breathing place, we'll take our first deep breath in together. So let's take our first deep breath in right here, breathing in and breathing out. Again, breathing in and breathing out. Final time, breathing in and breathing out. Let's pray together. God, thank you for this beautiful, rainy fall day. Thank you for all of the friends gathered here in this space to worship you. God, I pray that as we continue in worship tonight, you would quiet our minds so that we can listen to you more deeply with our hearts and our souls and our beings. Bless this worship service tonight. Bless all of us gathered, all of us watching, and everyone connected to this chapel community. These things we ask in your name.
shown us that unconditional love that we show one another. We ask for the rest of the week that you give us strength to overcome any issues or any problems. And we thank you that your grace and your mercy, they live with us. They are in us and they dwell with us. And we pray that we will not leave the same, that we, same way we came. And in your name I pray these things. everyone. How are y'all doing? Good? Good? Yeah. Okay, so today we are going to be singing this like really unknown hymn. No one knows about it, but we want to bring it to light. It's called Amazing Grace. And um, I just, I think it's really going to blow your mind. Um, and you know what? We're going to have a little fun with it tonight. So we're going to sing verses one, two, three, four, and six. Oh, it's number 378, by the way, if you would like to open and stand. Um, first verse, everyone's going to sing. Second verse, all the ladies are going to sing. Third verse, all the guys are going to sing. And I know there's very few, so you know what? Show off those vocal cords. It's really going to be fun. Fourth, a cappella, and then sixth, all together again. Are we ready? Let's do this thing.
Awesome. Before you guys sit down, I have a, a quick story. Um, as a, as a <laughs> very quick story, I promise. As a, as a, a young youth, um, my pastor, yes, a youth, you heard it right. Um, as a youth, my pastor once told me this. He said, there are two things you should never do alone. Get married and be a Christian. So please get up out of your pews, be in community, pass the peace of Christ.
and it's so positive, and like our life is just full of mercy and grace. And I'm just like, whew, I just want to say that. Okay. Um, can you please join me in prayer? Dear God, um, I thank you for this rain day. By water, we are cleansed. Um, in providing us peace to calm our anxious soul, by your words, we can breathe and are made strong. In protecting us and guiding us into the life that you want us to live, a life closer to you and a life full of mercy, grace, and love. Let us be disciples for you, Lord, and share that love that you have a boundless amount for us. Let's also pray, um, pray the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Hey guys, I'm Parker Newman. I'm one of the new members of the Board of Stewards. And for the thank you. Uh, <laughs> and for the first part of our scripture tonight, it will be Matthew 27, 45 to 46. And it is from noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Ali Ali Lima Shabbatani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the next part is Romans 8, 26, 28. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know how to pray as we ought, but that, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are, are called according to His purpose. Good evening. Good evening. How about a round of applause for Central High School? That's um. And I love the way that y'all embrace uh, these groups who've come in and sung over the last two weeks. Like I think about the group who came in last week. Um, got an email later in the week uh, from one of the students uh, who had put in a prayer card during the worship service that said how incredibly embraced they felt by y'all. Thank you. Right, like that was the thrill of their week. So, uh, some high school students who came and, and led in worship uh, here at High Point University. So thank you. Um, I want to introduce a friend of mine, uh, Manuka. Where are you? Are you? Will you stand up? From Duke uh, Divinity School is here. We give her a round of applause. Uh, if you're interested in thinking about seminary, come talk to this young lady after the service. She'll be downstairs breaking bread. Jackson, I see you. Jackson, yeah, you, yeah. Uh, seminary for you, buddy. Um, <laughs> Uh, so we continue, <laughs> uh, that was the best part of the evening, uh, we continue, uh, well actually the best part of this evening, uh, I think Jessica Wilson should uh, lead all hymns from here on out, what do you think? I've never had so much fun singing Amazing Grace in my entire life. Oh, uh, this is the fourth part of this series on embracing the questions, and tonight we're going to take like a step back uh, from thinking about uh, where is God, who is God in the midst of pain, in the midst of suffering, in the midst of struggle? Uh, all these things kind of bleed together. And where's this omnipotent God? Where's this omni omnipresent God? Where's this all-loving God in the midst of these things? Um, so earlier today, I, I sent, uh, I can't never pronounce it right, group me. I always pronounce the me too strong, group me, to the board of stewards and said, who has, <laughs> don't laugh at me. Uh, I said, who has the best Al Pacino? Um, uh, that's the one. And I asked, who's got that? No, and no one responded. They knew what I was looking for. I was looking for an Al Pacino moment here. Here's why. I don't know what it is about this time of year, uh, like today in particular with the rain, but there was this moment my junior year of college uh, where I was in a, a good funk, like a real good funk. Like nobody was going to mess up my funk. Uh, and I was going to make sure that I got to stay in this funk for a few days. And how hey, you stay in a funk today, like you would... 
put on Netflix all day long, right? And you would dig into that funk and like a movie would end and three seconds later another movie would start. But like if you're like John and Mai's age, right? Like, no, 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 you gotta stack the VHS tapes up. You gotta stack the DVDs up. Like, like you don't, and this is before Blu-ray. Like, that ain't even good quality either. It's grainy. And you gotta commit to the funk. And there was this, <laughs> this is so embarrassing. Uh, there was this one moment when I was in this funk and like eight movies in, I'm watching Scent of a Woman. <laughs> Add this to your cue. It's a brilliant film. Uh, a poor kid at a rich school uh, is caught in an honor code trial. And he's, he's essentially a witness to an act of, of a prank of some uh, very wealthy kids who have pranked the headmaster. Uh, and he's witnessed it. And the headmaster knows he's witnessed it. But uh, he won't confess that he knows who's done it. Like, he sticks to his guns and do not go do anything to President Cobain's car. I swear, like, this is not funny. Uh, and uh, so, but he, he sticks to his guns. He's not going to do any, He's not going to give them up. And, but they're going to let him fall. And during this time, he's trying to, like, ends meet as well. And he, he, one of the jobs he gets is to be a caretaker for a few days of a blind guy. And it's Al Pacino. And there's this incredibly powerful scene where this young kid knows that he's going to meet his fate in that he knows that he, he's, he's not going to come out of this honor code trial well, right? Uh, but at the same time, Al Pacino is going through his own stuff. And there's this really powerful scene where um, they're arguing back and forth, and finally Al Pacino yells out, I'm in the dark here! It's good, wasn't it? <laughs> I'm in the dark here! He's blind. He can't see anything. And he says, I'm all alone! I'm in my funk, and I'm sideways watching it, going, I, I'm in the dark here. Like, I feel you. I feel you, Al. I'm in the dark here. Like, way more questions than answers. About junior year, some of you juniors, been there's like, I don't even know who I am anymore. I don't know what I believe anymore. I don't understand anything, really, anymore. I'm in the dark here. Are you with me? I'm in the dark here. Um, I think there's times when we go through some certain, like, struggle or suffering or pain, and if you've ever had a vocabulary of who God is, all that gets thrown into question. Like, something terrible happens, well, if God is, let's get to the omnis, right? If God is omnipresent, then God certainly, like, was there. And what does that mean about God? If God was there while the pain, did God just let the pain happen? Or if God is all loving, does that mean that God just wasn't there? Because certainly a loving God wouldn't let something like that happen, you know? Or if God's omniscient, that means that God knew everything, right? Like we've heard the song of an alpha and omega. If the God knew everything, then why in the world would get such a God let something awful happen? You've got your own story, right? But like, just tension into a tailspin of those kind of things, and you're kind of just left with this kind of overriding big why. You know? What is going on? There's another good friend of mine about this time who had grown up in a really faithful home, and he just said he was done with it. Like, um, he's like, I can no longer go on believing in this good God when I see so much suffering going on in the world. I cannot do it anymore. I'm like, what is that? And I knew kind of where he was coming, up, coming from. Like, how do we make sense of this deep, loving, abiding God who is mercy and yet witness so much pain in the world? Uh, this sermon tonight, I want to take a step back from some of that emotional feeling and take a look at some of the places where we might be called to say such a thing and just take a little longer glance at them and look at them and we might come out on the other side with a little bit more healing, a little bit more grace, a little bit more mercy, a little bit more light in the midst of the darkness. Uh, some of you know, um, well before I even say that, like to understand this God whom we serve, right, um, I think some people look at the Christian faith and they might say that we're, uh, we're fairly Pollyanna, right? Pollyanna, we're kind of naive. Like it's all light. Um, I'm borrowing some on Adam and Hamilton tonight for the sermon. He said this in some ways better than me. But like, if you look at the Christian scriptures, the Jewish to Christian scriptures, it's all making meaning out of trauma. It's all making meaning out of darkness and going, where is God in the midst of this? It is not Pollyanna in the least. If you read the Old Testament scriptures, it's invasion upon invasion upon a minority people. 
and them still trying to be faithful to this God who is good, still finding this midst of mercy in the midst of being sacked after being sacked after being sacked, and still going, love wins. What is that? They're not Pollyanna. They're not blind to the harshness of life. Or you go to the New Testament, right? And what is it? Our very Lord and Savior goes to the cross, and uh, man, Parker's uh, Aramaic was really good. Eli, Eli, uh, Eli, Sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's in the very mouths of the one, of the mouth of the one we follow, right? It is not in the least blinded by or, or unseen to the harshness of the world. It steps right into it. Really interesting, right? It's not Pollyanna or naive at all. Actually, it sees the world for exactly what it is, that it's actually got some real pain and darkness in it. And then Jesus asks us to go on a little further journey, right? Like there is the pain and darkness, but it is not last. There's more. Some of us uh, try to deal with this um, in ways that I think we think it helps. And if you are a senior, you know my, um, how do I say it? Uh, my, uh, like, uh, little problem that I have with everything happens for a reason. And I think some of us would use that, and as I want to go to this before I look at some of the places where we, uh, where we think about where suffering happens. And we think on the surface it looks like a really faithful thing. At Interfaith, Interfaith Dinner Club on Monday night, uh, we had a lot of us from different uh, faith traditions, and we're sitting at tables, and we're asking, what are just some of our favorite quotes? And a young woman said that, like, everything happens for a reason. Like, I really believe this. Uh, it really takes me. It really helps me. And I think if it's said from here, I want to get into this a little bit. I think when bad things happen, we'll often say it. And if it's coming out of your own experience, that means I, I want to give the benefit of the doubt. There's something really hopeful about it, right? Like you're like, I'm not done yet. God's not done with me yet. Something of this pain that I'm in right now is going to take me, and, and God's going to do something with it, right? Uh, there's going to be a reason to this. Where does it get problematic, though, is like if you're with somebody and they're going through something, and you say to them, everything happens for a reason. It's a harsh word, right? Like they're in the midst of the, of the torture chamber and you're like, everything happens for a reason. You can't see it yet, but, that, but there's a reason for this. It's like if you step back from that for just a moment, right? What we're saying then is like, it's, it's quite malicious about God. Is God is causing your suffering in some way for your own good? Is is that the God we serve? Leslie Weatherhead wrote a book called The Will of God. Great little illustration on this. Horrific in some ways, but really to the point. Uh, he was in a place where a cholera epi epidemic was, and there was someone who said, and it's that cholera epidemic, everything happens for a reason. And he asked the man who said that, he said, say a man broke into this village, and at night he took a chloroform rag and put it around the face of a young child. What would you do to that man? And they said, well, we'd find that man. We'd put him on trial. He'd go away for years and years and years, we, if not worse. He says, do you realize that's the description you've just given God? Is that the God we serve? Is that the God we worship? I don't know, man. I got some shortcomings there. I don't, I don't, want, I don't want to say that I understand the full fullness of who God is. No human can, and we should have a lot of reservations. We should walk humbly before God, but there's something about us. We want to be really careful with our words, right? Because we may not be describing God at all in our sense to have a kind of pretense about what it looks like to be Christian and saying everything happens for a reason. I like what Paul says. He says, no, we rejoice with those who rejoice, but we weep with those who weep. Don't give shallow answers. Give some presence, right? So, what are some of those major places that we see, right, when suffering happens and we uh, might um, abandon God or ill-define God? And so I want to go through them just a little bit tonight. This is going to end stepping back from the, from the pain a little bit and examining it. And the three places we might see it ha happen quite often are um, in sickness uh, and in natural disasters. And the final one, in the own suffering and pain that we inflict. And sometimes don't even see that we do so. Sickness. I never pray for more things than people's sickness. It's really interesting, right? When you ask, when you enter a room and if you ask to pray, what's the first thing someone's going to ask for? It's going to be around sickness. It's going to be around a grandparent, a parent, 
an aunt who's sick. And there's something about that that's real, and you've got to enter into it with people. But I also am recognizing that rarely do we ever, when we ask to pray, do we recognize what an incredible, like, amazing thing our bodies are. Like, they're actually remarkable. You know how I know? Go scratch a car and see if it'll heal itself. These things are wonders that we have, aren't they? And we only fail to recognize it when something goes wrong. I, I love the Gunger song, right? Like, we are fragile, fragile creatures. And sing it with me if you know it, but it's, You make beautiful things. You make beautiful things out of dust. You make beautiful things. You make beautiful things out of us. We pray for we're in the midst of sickness, but like on the other end of it, what a wonder these bodies are, right? They're, they're a wonder and at the same time really fragile. Like we're made of dust. We say it every Lent when we begin Lent, so we don't have too high of an expectation of these bodies that we have. They are from the dust and to the dust they shall return, right? They're like a temporary gift, and that temporary gift gives them their very beauty. Would you take eternal life right now? It's Halloween. Take eternal life on this earth right now? You'd be a vampire. Watch Interview with a Vampire. It's not a great deal. Add it to your horror list, I guess, for the, for the, the Halloween season. No, no, no. You, actually, it's temporariness that you've got, the shortness that you've got, and this wonder of a body you've got. It's actually amazing. It is indeed a miracle. Your very living, breathing body filled with God's precious breath. The other end of that is these fragile bodies that we often have end up in natural disasters. This is the one that happens often, right? Oftentimes when there's like a big natural disaster, we'll find ourselves in this chapel. We'll be praying about natural disasters. Um, I remember we had a, a gathering for one of these uh, after Houston once, and we were downstairs uh, with a small group, and we were talking about it, and one young man just went, you know what, this, this must have been God's will, right? This had to have been God's will, I and mean, it's, it's part of the world, like, we've just got to embrace it, we've got to, um, we, we've got to, got to just uh, sort of accept it, and something let me just sort of push back on that, like, is it God's will to go and run, like, tornadoes into people's houses, or to open up earthquakes, or to consume people in a hurricane, like our bodies, I would almost like flip it on its head, right? Like, like this is going to sound weird coming from a, like a preacher's mouth, but like think about like how incredible tectonic plates are. <laughs> Come with me on this journey. We're going together. It's like amazing, right? Like tectonic plates are over top of magma. And like, and like it's, they're floating on magma all the time. You go back to your ninth grade uh, like geology lesson here, right? And like, like, it's a wonder that they're not exploding all the time, right? Like, and, like they, they shift and they turn, and when they collide together, an earthquake happens. I took a group of students uh, from my last church to Haiti after the major earthquake. And you know what we learned, like, from that? Like, is God causing these earthquakes, or is it typically poor folk who get caught in the earthquakes? Seemingly, most of the time, rich folk rarely get caught in earthquakes because they have homes that can withstand them. But something about poor folk, they get caught up in these things all the time because they don't have the means to, to avoid the disaster. Is that something of God or is that something of us? Like it's a wonder this world, some of you are in our pre-med or in sciences here, and it's amazing this world we're on, right? Like you think of what a gift it is, 100 yards to the left or the right, and this world does not exist. Like, it's all in some complex, incredible design that's, again, like your body. And what's going to be an incredible miracle? A miracle that it goes on day in, day out. Sun comes up, moon comes up, you wake up, you get to participate in this. Like, I don't know how we're not in awe all the time. But something so beautiful, it's got a beautiful edge to it, doesn't it? And fragile bodies end up on edges sometimes. Is that God's will, or is it just something about the whole fragileness of it all and the beauty of it all? When God has any intention of throwing humans into disasters, but we're fragile people who find our way there. Are you with me? 
So we're going to step back a little bit tonight. This is about as quiet as chapel has ever been. If it's um, something about this beautiful edge and fragile bodies, I'll never forget um, my senior year of college. I got a call. This was about late in February. I got a call from one of my best friends. And um, he said, Preston, there's been an accident. I used to not be able to talk about this without bursting into tears. And he said, um, there was an accident. Uh, Griff was on a boat off the coast of North Carolina. And um, he didn't make it. And Griff, man, I wish I, I wish y'all had seen Griff. Uh, awful name, terrible, uh, terrible name, amazing person. <laughs> Griff, like, uh, like, was six foot three, 200 pounds. He was like a man among boys, and you never wanted to be beside Griff because none of the ladies would look at you. They'd always look at Griff. <laughs> and Griff, man, uh, he, was, he, he went to Lees McRae University or College, became a volunteer fireman. And he was out with this volunteer fireman, and they were out on the, on the inlet on, uh, in North Carolina in late February, and it was unusually cold that day. And I forget being at his funeral and sitting right beside my, my, one of my other good friends, Wesley Gibson, and like he kept hitting his thigh with his hand, going, he was the best of us. He was the best of us. I'll never forget being in that line, uh, seeing Griff's mom, and someone coming up to her and saying, oh, Margaret. I'm so sorry. Everything happens for a reason. And I wanted to punch that person in the back. Sorry. Sorry for people streaming at home. <clears throat> God did not kill Griff. You know what killed Griff? Unusually high gusts of wind that day. 50 degree waters. And the Griff had 3% body fat. Beautiful people will get caught in a world that's beautiful with a sharp edge sometimes. And it's not God's will. But you know, some of the things I saw at that funeral as well, I've never seen more love and affection as well. Where is God in the midst of these things? Did you hear Jesus' cry? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's an incredible cry. It's from Psalm 22. And it's a lament about the pain in the world. And if you're a Christian, you go on this far journey, it's not just a man saying that. It's God's very self saying it. And as if God's saying, I, there is no pain in this world in which I will not enter into. Like all the beautiful edges and sharp places of the world, I take them on my own body. That's amazing. It goes to those infinite places, places of pain, and sits in them with us. Oof remarkable if there's natural disasters if there's our fragile bodies that we might have some problems and be riddled with questions the last one really is the one that's the most C.S. Lewis once said four-fifths of all suffering in the world are caused by us I like what uh, Reinhold Niebuhr once said he said the only verifiable real truth and he's a theologian in Christianity is that humans are indeed sinful <laughs> And what he's saying there is really remarkable. He's saying that um, this thing about God, God creates, and God creates you and me, and he actually gives things that are so beautiful that they can create, and they have this freedom to do with their creativity what they will. And we use our freedom poorly sometimes. And we can hurt each, hurt each other so much sometimes. Again, Christianity is not naive or idyllic. It sees us for who we are and then takes us to a higher level. I think that God, we often yell out with a why to God, and God says right back to us, why? We say, God, do something about it, and God looks back at us and says, you can do something about this. I mean, think about hunger in our neighborhood, right? Right? right here in High Point. Is it a God problem or is it a distribution problem? We got far more freedom and we can use it in ways that we haven't quite imagined. We can use it to do much more than we think we can. Nelson Mandela, when he was let out of prison, this, um, this journalist came up, to, um, and if you knew anything about South Africa at that time, it was uh, coming out of apartheid and starting a new free society. 
And the journalist said, and, and Nelson Mandela was let out of prison, he says, how does it, doesn't it feel good to be free and that you can start this new country? And he says, we are not free. We are only free that we might be free. Some of you have heard me talk about this so often. We are free from quite often. Oh, but it's within our power, and if we follow Jesus, to be free to that kind of life. Free to love as we should. Free to be alongside one another as we should. Free to be in this world as God originally imagined. Are you with me? Mm. It's a different way. A different way of looking into the world. Freedom to. I mean, if you think about it, it's another example. This time last year, we gathered in here, actually right on the steps. Haley sang an incredible song after the shooting at Tree of Life Synagogue. Is that God? Or is that somebody filled with anti-Semitism walking into a temple? Not God. It's us. We, are freedom, we have freedom from quite often, but we need to have some freedom too, friends. We look back, this is not quite all these things of God's doing. They're us. They're us. God doesn't go around with his finger on triggers, with his hand on steering wheels. That's us. And what I think is most powerful about the gospel in this is it's not denying any of the pain in the world. It's that cry on the cross. If anyone could ask me why I believe in God, I would say it's because I believe in Jesus. And when I look at Jesus, I think that's what God would look like in this world. When I focus on Jesus, right, like I see a God who comes into this world and leaves no stone unturned, no place of pain, begotten or forgotten, gives his very body to it, and lands there with people in the midst of the pain and suffering, and says, I will not leave you forsaken. There's this great parable. I think it actually comes out of the Mormon tradition. Man. It's really beautiful. And it's this, that the devil and God are having a debate about us wayward people at one point. And, says, you know, and the devil says, you know how you can keep them in line? You just assign an angel to each one of them, and they'll do exactly what you want them to do. And God says, eh, that doesn't sound like freedom. It sounds like puppets. And Jesus says, who's listening in, says, I got, I got another idea. How about, how about you let them live and make some choices? But why don't you send me? I'll show them how to love. I'll show them how to be alongside one another. I'll show them how to not just love their family, but to love their enemies. I'll show them how to not give cliched answers, but to give real presence. Because that's exactly what God does with us, right? We have deep pain, and God doesn't give us some simple answer. God gives us God's very self. And it's a miracle. Because think about it this way. When you were in the deepest valley, when you were in the most pain, do you want simple, tidy words of comfort? Or do you want a body right there beside you? Do you want a best friend who's in it with you? Do you want somebody right alongside you? Oh, I know which one. I'll take in a heartbeat. Even if it's silence alongside me. I'll take a presence any day of the week. Not simple answers but a profound presence, a holy presence of God's very self. So this has been a heavy message, to say the least. I want to show you this. We show, Josiah, I want to finish with this. Uh, this was earlier today. <laughs> you can oon off it. Uh, the, the, that's Christopher on your left, and that's, nope, oh my gosh, I did it again. Uh, that's Christopher on your right, and that's Jordan on your left. Uh, we took this picture this morning. Uh, at their um, at their preschool, and I, and I think about Halloween this time of year, and the reason I'm showing you this uh, is because something that happened about this time last year. We had another really heavy chapel service last year, and I was tired. I was really tired, and um, I was heading home, and Dorset, my wife, called, and she said, uh, "Hey, I need you to stop at the grocery store to get something before you come home." And so I stopped at the food line as I was going in, and um, if people look at me weird on campus when I wear a collar, like being a food line shopping <laughs> with a collar on, and people are like, what was that? 
Um, but I got to the I got to the uh, to the register, and this was a little before Halloween. And the uh, clerk looked at me and said, "Is that a costume or is that real?" And I thought for a moment, man, like I was tired. I want to go home. And something in me wanted to say, "That's it's a, it's a costume." And I said, "No, no, it's real." And she said, I, I need you to pray for my son. He's not doing well right now. He's not making very good decisions, and I'm not handling it well. And there's, like, people who are starting to line up behind us. <laughs> and they're stacking things up on the counter. And I said, would you like me to pray with you now? And she said, yes. And I didn't have a lot of words, but it was some presence, at least for the moment. And I think about us who have the kind of courage to come and gather in a room like this. It's, it's, it's Halloween, but there's a certain kind of journey that Jesus takes us on. Are, are we going to dress up into this Christian thing, or are we going to do it? And it's not seeing the world with rose-tinted lenses. It's not seeing it as Pollyanna. It's seeing it for the very brokenness and pain that's in it. And saying despair is not an option. For there's one who's given his very presence to us. And we hope in it, and we believe all things and pray all things, and therefore for that presence, we can be present with one another. May it be so for you. Amen. If y'all would stand and sing with us.
Would y'all find a hand of somebody near you while we pray? Let's see if you. Will y'all pray with me? Precious God, the wind and waves, they know your name. And may we, may we know that you have seen us, and more than seen us, you have given us your very self. And so there is no darkest valley that you do not walk in with us. It may be in silence sometimes, but it is your very presence with us. And so send us forth from this place to be your presence in the world. That we shall see the darkness, but know the darkness does not overcome us, for your light is there. So bless us and keep us, and all those whom we see in front of us. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. So may you go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.